Our call to worship this Lord's Day is taken from Psalm 36, verses 9 through 11. For with thee is the fountain of life, in thy light shall we see light. O continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee, and thy righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, and let not the hand of the wicked remove me. Let us stand together in prayer. Our gracious God, we praise thee that we are gathered again on this Lord's Day to remember and to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We glory our God in the gospel of Jesus Christ that has redeemed us, has saved us, has delivered us from the wrath to come. And Lord, we, we await even thy word to us. But Father, we also offer to thee uh, our sacrifices of praise and worship and pray that thou would receive them through the mediation of the Lord Jesus Christ and through that same mediation, O Lord, forgive us and cleanse us of all of our sins and iniquities as we approach thee, that we may uh, offer unto thee worship that is acceptable in thy sight through Christ our Savior. Amen. Let us turn in our Psalters to Psalm 104, and we'll be singing verses 10 through 15. Here we see that praise is to be given to the Lord for his daily provision, not only for us, but for all his creatures that he has made. And if the Lord does particularly provide every day for all of his creatures, that which is necessary to sustain life, how much more will he not sustain us who are his own beloved and dear children? How much more will he not provide for our needs? if he provides for the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air. As Jesus said, O ye of little faith, let us rejoice in God's provision for all of his creation. We'll be using the tune Downs, and I'll be lining the psalm out. Downs begins... Dun 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 dun. <clears throat> he to the valleys sends the springs. He to the valleys sends the springs which run among the hills. Which run among the hills, they to all beasts of field give drink. They to all beasts of field give drink. Wild asses drink their fills. Wild asses drink their fills. By them the fowls of heaven shall have. By them the fowls of heaven shall have their habitation. Their habitation. Which do among the branches sing. Which do among the branches sing, 
with de delectation. With delectation. He from his chambers watereth. He from his chambers watereth. The hills when they are dried. The hills when they are dried. With fruit and increase of thy works. With fruit and increase of thy works. The earth is satisfied. The earth is satisfied. For cattle he makes grass to grow. For cattle he makes grass to grow. He makes the herb to spring. He makes the herb to spring. For the use of man that food to him. For the use of man that food to him. He from the earth may bring. He from the earth may bring. And wine that to the heart of man. And wine that to the heart of man doth cheerfulness impart. The cheerfulness impart. Oil that his face makes shine and bread. Oil that his face makes shine and bread. That strengtheneth his heart. That strengtheneth his heart. Let us continue our worship of our great and mighty God as we continue in our Old Testament scripture reading today, in Zephaniah chapter 2, in the first chapter we saw that God brings judgment upon Judah. In this chapter we see that uh, the God of nations brings judgment for sin that the nations commit against them as well. Uh, he's not only the God uh, who uh, is to be worshipped, by Judah, by Israel, but he's the God to be worshipped by the entire world. And when, when the world turns against him, and when the world practices idolatry and blasphemy uh, and erects their idols uh, and, uh, uh, and violates his, his holy commandments that are revealed in nature, uh, the Lord brings judgment uh, even against the nations uh, for uh, what they know they should do, that they suppress an unrighteousness by way of the law of nature. And so let us uh, give careful attention here uh, to God's word as it's read uh, in Zephaniah chapter 2. <clears throat> Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together. O nation, not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness, it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. Woe unto the inhabitants of the sea coast, the nation of the Carathites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan. 
the land of the Philistines. I will even destroy thee, that there shall be no inhabitant. And the sea coast shall be a dwellings and cottages for shepherds and foals for flocks. And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon in the houses of Ashkelon. Shall they lie down in the evening? For the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the revilings of the children of Ammon, whereby they have reproached my people and magnified themselves against their border. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding of nettles and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall spoil them and the remnant of my people shall possess them. This shall they have for their pride because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be terrible unto them for he will famish all the gods of the earth and men shall worship him, every one from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. Ye Ethiopians also, ye shall be slain by my sword, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and will make Nineveh a desolation, and dry like a wilderness, and flocks shall lie down in the midst of her, all the beasts of the nations, both the cormorant and the bittern shall lodge in the upper lintels of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the thresholds, for he shall uncover the cedar work. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How is she become a desolation? a place for beasts to lie down in. Everyone that passeth by her shall hiss and wag his hand. Let us stand together as God's people in prayer. Most blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord, we bow before thee. We bring, Lord, unto thee our, our hearts. Break them and make them contrite before thee, our God. May we not approach thee exalting ourselves. May we not approach thee thinking that we in any way deserve to come into thy presence, accepted by thee, blessed by thee. But, oh Lord, may we be reminded uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ every day and throughout the day that we are what we are by the grace of God alone because Jesus Christ has redeemed us because Jesus Christ has imputed his righteousness unto us and forgiven us and cleansed us of all unrighteousness and because the my spirit has uh, applied that redemption unto us we ask our Lord that thou would grant to us uh, now as we come into thy presence that we would remember that thou art God and there is none other. And though nations may cry out and great nations and cities throughout history have cried out, I am and there is none other. They have robbed thee of thy glory. They have made themselves and that which they worship uh, to be their idols and their gods. Even this nation in which we live, O oh God, and the nations of this world proudly exalt themselves and say, I am and there is none other. We pray our God, show and reveal to these nations that they are a speck of dust in thy sight. They are like grasshoppers whom thou can at any moment crush. We pray, Father, that thou would awaken the nations of this world to the perilous times in which we live. 
and that we as Christians, our Lord, would not be uh, brought down, depressed, discouraged uh, by the events that we see in happening all around us, but that God, we would see that it is in the very midst of these events that the kingdom of God advances. There is no force in hell. There is no force uh, on earth uh, that can withstand and withhold thy hand and keep thy uh, kingdom from advancing. And so, Lord God, we pray that our hope, our faith, will be entirely in thee this day, regardless of what we may be facing in our lives, our homes, uh, in uh, our, at our work, in jobs, uh, Lord, in, uh, in uh, this nation. Lord, we plead with thee that thou would bind up our hearts now. Forgive us as we confess our sins, Lord. Hear our prayer of confession. Bend low thine ear, come near unto us, we pray. Have mercy upon us as thy people. Give to us, Lord, renewed hope, renewed strength, perseverance and steadfastness to walk in accordance with thy commandments and in accordance with thy holy gospel. We pray, our Father, uh, as we approach thee today, forgive us for our lack of fear of thee, our taking thee, for granted, our profaning and treating as common that which is holy, making gods and lovers out of the very gifts that thou hast given to us in this world. Forgive us for trusting in the arm of flesh to save and to rescue us, rather than trusting in the arm of God, who alone can rescue and save us. We ask our Lord that thou would forgive us for our neutrality and and seeking to walk the fence between wholehearted commitment to thee and a wholehearted commitment to this world. Uh, Lord, we pray that thou would give to us, Lord, uh, that loyalty, that faithfulness in which we lay down all, present our lives as living sacrifices unto thee every day. That, Father, we would see that uh, that our life is not about uh, uh, about our pleasures. Our life is not about uh, serving ourselves ultimately, but our life is about enjoying and glorifying thee and advancing thy kingdom through all of the trials and afflictions and persecutions and tribulations we face in this world. We ask our Father, forgive us for... for uh, uh, our lack of boldness, our need of boldness in the face of persecution uh, and running away uh, from, uh, from persecution and fear rather, O oh God, than standing fast and knowing that thou wilt use us whatever we face. Lord, if we, if we walk in dependence upon the Spirit, if thou Holy Spirit, does fill us. Lord, there is nothing that thou cannot accomplish through our lives, through the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ. That power that raised him from the dead is that power which abides and lives within us. And Lord, we plead with thee that we would be those who are not blindsided, uh, who are not so overwhelmed, God, uh, by uh, the trees uh, in which... Uh, we live uh, that uh, are so tall, uh, that are so uh, great and mighty that they seem to block out heaven itself from us. We pray our Father, help us to see beyond uh, even the greatness of those trees that are like great enemies, to see the glory of heaven, to see that Jesus Christ reigns upon his glorious throne. He is sovereign. He is moving history forward. He is advancing his kingdom where, Lord God, it does not advance in one place. Lord, he causes it to advance in another place and so, until the whole world will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. We pray, Father, that thou would forgive us for our shame and embarrassment 
of uh, walking this narrow path and this narrow way. Uh, prayer and Lord, we, we allow the ridicule, the mockery, uh, the jabs that come our way, light, very light persecution in comp uh, comparison to what so many are suffering throughout the world. And yet we allow these to so upset us and so deter us, to so take us, Lord, from that path of righteousness and truth. Lord, we pray that thou would strengthen us, that thou would give to us the grace that we would not be uh, defensive, that we would not allow these offenses, Lord, to crush and destroy us. But, oh God, that we would cast all our care upon the Lord Jesus Christ, all of our burdens, knowing that he cares for us. And he is not unsettled. He is not... Uh, in fear. He is not shuddering. Uh, he is not anxious uh, in heaven. He is working out every plan and every decree and every purpose just as he has ordained. And may Lord God, we not only profess, but we may we live uh, through our lives every day that Jesus Christ is Lord. We ask our Lord that thou would forgive us for not seeing the benefits of uh, persecution and suffering and trial and hardships and disappointments due to our, our worldliness, due to the fact that we are not eyeing our Savior because our eye is upon our circumstances, because we are walking by sight and not by faith. We pray, forgive us, our God, cleanse us, and may we lay hold, O oh Lord, of the promises that the Lord Jesus has given unto us, who never lies. Lord, we listen so often more to the whispers of the enemy, Satan, who is a liar, rather than listening to the faithful witness, the Lord Jesus Christ. Have mercy upon us, our Father. Cleanse us, wash us. We, we, we are assured, Lord, as we have confessed our sins, that thou art faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pray, our Father, that thou would uh, grant to our families, Lord, that uh, uh, the conflicts that, that uh, exist within them, that, Lord, we would not be those who set stumbling blocks that, Lord, we would be looking for every way that we possibly can to remove those annoyances, those stumbling blocks, uh, that we would not be uh, troublemakers, but that, Father, we would be peacemakers, that we would be seeking our God to live in peace with thee, removing the sin that separates us by way of our confession every day, removing, O oh God, uh, any of those hindrances to our fellowship and communion with thee every day. But we pray, Father, as well, in our homes and our families, which is, again, to be a little sanctuary where Jesus Christ is honored and served, where uh, the profession is, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord in faithfulness. We will serve the Lord without compromise. We will serve the Lord in loving one another. We will serve the Lord in promoting and declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ and living it out in our homes. Lord, uh, we are selfish. We are headstrong. We are stubborn. We do not want to give up those things that that we enjoy things that we find pleasure in, even if it is offensive uh, to others in the family. We pray our God that thou would strip us of our pride, humble us, that Lord, we would see what Jesus Christ was willing to give up in order to reconcile us unto the living God. We pray our Father that thou would Look upon thy church, Father, that thou would heal the many divisions that exist within her, that God, thou would uh, remove the sectarianism that's evident in, in the various denominations, O oh God, that God, uh, we would be those 
uh, who seek to be united under the faithful covenants of, of our forefathers, under the doctrines that, that are biblical and, and that are found in our confession of faith, summarized in our confession of faith, found in the word of God, uh, in pure worship that's summarized in our confession of faith and is found and grounded in the word of God. Lord, we pray that thou would give to thy church a blessed uniformity in, in doctrine, worship, and church government. Our Father, that we would love peace, that we would love and pray for that peace. That God, we would not hold within our breasts, Lord, uh, uh, bitterness and resentment uh, toward brethren, that God, thou would forgive us and heal us. That God, thou would cast us down before thee to see once again uh, that uh, this uh, bitterness and resentment toward others will destroy us. And uh, Lord, uh, uh, as we do so, we will not be promoting the kingdom of, of God. We pray our Lord that, that thou would raise up for us gospel officers, Lord, who will faithfully promote teach, instruct, guide, and lead uh, thy people, uh, the flock of thy pasture, in accordance with our uh, uh, blessed covenants and confessions and catechisms. Lord, that uh, thou would give to us those who are ever faithful and true, who will not be hirelings, who will not be there uh, uh, simply to earn uh, of the approval of others, simply to earn a paycheck, uh, simply to draw attention to themselves, but Lord, that thou would give unto us those uh, shepherds that indeed will be willing as our savior, the good shepherd to lay down their lives for the flock. We ask and plead with thee, our Lord, that thou would grant to this nation repentance, repentance that leads unto everlasting life, repentance that is granted by thee, not a mere regret, but, O oh God, recognition how this nation has become like Sodom and Gomorrah, how this nation has become like Rome and Greece, and Babylon and Assyria of old, with all of its pantheon of gods that it serves and, and worships. We pray our Father, forgive and, and grant, Lord God, forgiveness. Grant, Lord God, that this nation would turn uh, its, uh, its eye of faith uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the only hope for this nation is the gospel. There is no hope, O oh God, in man or in the arm of flesh. Uh, Lord, there is only hope in thee, the living God. We pray that thou would uh, turn uh, this nation from uh, uh, even the consensus that uh, of of uh, uh, its population that one at one time uh, gave credence to the Christian faith. But, O oh Lord, we see again that we are being overrun, Lord, by every false religion because we have turned from the living God and, and the laws that are being uh, drafted and proposed and enacted are laws that thou dost hate, uh, laws that uh, bring shame upon the Christian religion, laws that bring shame upon the law of God. We pray, rise up, O Lord our God, uh, in, thy, in thy might and in thy power, and subdue, Lord God, the hearts of leaders unto thyself. In turn, Lord, thy people uh, unto thee. Draw them out of all of the false religions. Draw thy people out, O God, that thou hast chosen to rescue and save. 
draw them out even out of Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism, draw them out of the Church of Rome, out of Mormonism and, and the Jehovah Witnesses, draw out thy people, our God, and cause them to fearlessly stand for thy truth. And be with, O oh God, thy church that is being persecuted and throughout the world that is suffering, O oh God, so greatly uh, by way of afflictions, by way of imprisonment and torture, uh, by way of, of driving uh, uh, those who profess faith in Jesus Christ out of their homes and into barren lands. We, we plead with thee, our God, be with them, uphold them. And, sustain their faith and their trust in thee and crush we pray all of these thine enemies we pray our father that thou would uh, hear our prayers for those who are sick those who are uh, discouraged those who are lord who are feel overwhelmed today uh, lord uh, whose hearts are broken uh, we pray our god lift us all up for we need thee. Uh, without thee, we can do nothing, but we can do all things through Christ to strengthen us. We pray our Father grant a blessing, Lord, to, to the providers of households, O oh God. Bring work their way that they may be able, our God, to give thee glory for having uh, added work uh, unto them that they, Lord, can provide for the needs of their family, that, Lord, we can see uh, thy kingdom continue to grow through our children and uh, through our families. We plead with thee, our Father, that uh, thou would uh, be with those, our Lord, today who uh, are lost, who are within the sound of my voice, those who have been playing games with thee, those, O oh Lord, who have not been faithful, those who have fallen away, Lord, use thy word and by thy spirit, draw them back, draw them unto thee into salvation, draw them unto thee for sanctification, we pray. We lift up, Lord, our burdens, our requests unto thee today. We glorify thee, we exalt thee, our God. For thou art great, there is none like unto thee in heaven and earth or under the earth, Lord God. And Lord, we we pray now, cause thy word to go forth with great power and might to change hearts and lives. Bring forth, O oh God, fruit uh, from the preaching of thy word. We ask our Lord that thou would be glorified, that thou would anoint even the lips of, of thy servant today as thy word is proclaimed. Take it, our God, may it not simply go in one ear and out the other, but may our God it enter into our hearts through our spiritual ears. We plead with thee, our Lord, uh, in, in hearing us, we praise thee, and in answering our prayers as we've called upon thee through Christ our Savior today. Amen. Amen. Our New Testament scripture reading this Lord's Day is taken from Mark chapter 10. And we'll finish the chapter today, beginning with verse 28. Verse 28 through verse 52. Here we see in one of the portions of this New Testament scripture reading the desire for the disciples to reign with Christ, to have uh, that exalted status, to be upon his right hand, to be upon his left hand, who would be greatest in the kingdom of God. And uh, the Lord Jesus makes it very clear. If you do not suffer with me, you won't reign with me. If you are not willing to count the cost, if you're not willing to call him Lord, and submit all to him, 
you will not reign with Christ in heaven. And so this is, again, the calling not of super Christians, but the calling of every Christian uh, to lay down their life for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be a servant of Jesus Christ. Yes, there will be a time of reigning, and we look forward to that time, reigning with Christ in heaven. But right now, it's a time of suffering with Christ, for Jesus Christ here upon the earth even as he himself, the son of God, did not simply take the easy path to glory in heaven. He took the same path, so we walk in his steps. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus answered, or said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so it shall not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. 
And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. <clears throat> Our text this Lord's Day is taken from Acts chapter 17, and we'll be considering verses 1 through 15 together this Lord's Day. <clears throat> Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and search the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women which were Greeks, and of men not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Sometimes we cannot see the greater and larger forest because of the individual trees that surround us. That's all we see are these huge trees. We do not have the perspective to see from God's perspective in heaven, the whole forest to which, according to God, that, that forest is very small. Uh, if you're 30,000 feet up in the air, that forest looks pretty small. But when you're right in the midst of the trees, they seem so overwhelming, so huge. 
The same happens when we, dear ones, are so preoccupied with the enemies that we face in our world, like those great huge trees that surround us, that we cannot see heaven's view of Christ's kingdom and what Christ is accomplishing in this world, in our lives, in our families. We tend to interpret the advance of Christ's kingdom or the lack thereof based upon what we see with our natural eyes and what we hear with our natural ears. We see in the news the onslaught of Islamic Jihad in many places throughout the world and the carnage of, of victims, the blood that has been spilt that lay in its path. We hear of the spread and the acceptance of every form of, of immorality and not only the practice of it, but the defense of it, the protection of it legally within nations in gay pride marches and nations approving same-sex, so-called same-sex marriages. When we dear ones, see and when we hear of the advent of these idolatrous and immoral revolutions, we may be so overwhelmed like huge trees around us that we wonder what happened? What happened to the kingdom of Jesus Christ? Is Jesus Christ yet Lord? Does he still reign over all from his sovereign throne in heaven? Beloved, we need to take a step back from those trees that overshadow, that overwhelm us, those huge trees in our family, in our job, in the church, and in this nation, to look beyond the trees and to see heaven's perspective. Just as fear, Jones, gripped the heart of the servant of Elisha, when he could only see all the armies of the Syrians that surrounded Helm and Elisha in that, in that small town of Dothan in 2 Kings chapter 6. So we will fear when we can only see the army of the enemy surrounding our lives, surrounding our families, surrounding the church, surrounding our nation. But when the prophet Elisha prayed that the eyes of his servant might be opened, he saw the multitudes of God's mighty hosts that had surrounded the enemies that the servant saw, the Syrian army. They were surrounded by the mighty hosts of angelic beings throughout the mountainside all around them. And were there to defend and to protect uh, Elisha and the servant. We must, dear ones, likewise take a look by faith from heaven's view. Where, dear ones, God is not shuddering in fear. Where Jesus Christ reigns in sovereign peace and tranquility not in anxiety and where the armies of heaven surround all the enemies that you and your family or the church faces the kingdom of jesus christ dear ones advances despite the hatred the cruelty and the persecution that come against us in standing for the lord jesus christ and his truth this truth, <clears throat> I submit to you, is clearly observed from our text today in the opposition that Paul and Silas face. These faithful servants of Jesus Christ will not surrender despite the hatred and the cruelty of God's enemies, but faithfully and steadfastly move from city to city to city leaving behind 
new converts, seeds that are going to grow and develop and bring forth churches that will advance the kingdom of Jesus Christ. No power on earth, no power on earth, dear ones, can prevent the advance of Christ's kingdom. And the main points from our text this Lord's Day are the following. <clears throat> First of all, trouble follows Paul's effective preaching in Acts 17, 1 through 9. Second main point, blessing follows the Bereans' effective listening in Acts 17, verses 10 through 15. So we're going to be considering effective preaching and effective hearing today that both advance the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Verses one through nine, once again, Acts 17, verses one through nine. <clears throat> now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. <clears throat> After the earthquake that the Lord brought in Philippi, the prison there in Philippi that God used to bring the jailer to saving faith in Jesus Christ, Paul and Silas were, you'll recall, released from prison, but they would not leave the city until the magistrates themselves had come and to the prison, wherein uh, the magistrate shuddered because Paul and Silas had made clear to them that they were Roman citizens and they had been beaten with rods, bruised, bloodied. They had been beaten for no just cause, not even having had uh, their accus the accusations brought against them to be heard and uh, to be tried. And the magistrates did... Uh, come, they did release uh, Paul and Silas from prison. And upon their release, in verse 40, chapter 16, verse 40, they uh, it briefly visit and encourage the infant church that was gathered at Lydia's house. As we now come to Acts chapter 17, Paul and Silas and their team pass through the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia, they head for the capital of Macedonia, namely Thessalonica in Acts 17.1, which is now presently at this, at this time, uh, in this day in which we now live, is the second largest city uh, in Greece. Uh, it's sometimes called Thessalonica, sometimes Salonica, uh, but it is still uh, a vibrant and uh, growing city, second largest, as I said, in Greece. It has been 
in just a few days as they arrive in Thessalonica. It's only been a few days since Paul and Silas were cruelly beaten with rods there in Philippi. Surely the pain from the stripes and the bruises they had received were still a constant reminder to them of the enemies that they faced, the enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet Paul and Silas were not moved by fear. They were not held or they were not par paralyzed by fear, by those dark shadows of those trees that surrounded them. They did not cower before them, but in Acts 17 too, they marched right back into the lion's den to preach the gospel to the Jews in their synagogue, as was the practice of Paul in ministering to the Jews. And we read that he did so in verse 2, three consecutive Sabbaths, that is, three consecutive Jewish Sabbaths. Now, in, in doing so, going, as we've noted, I think we've mentioned this in the past, Paul, Silas, uh, going into synagogues or Previously in the cities of Galatia, Paul and Barnabas going into Jewish synagogues on the Sabbath day was not in any way uh, an indication of their recognizing the seventh day Jewish Sabbath to be yet binding upon them. But they went on the Jewish Sabbath and into the synagogue because that's where the Jews were. They knew that they would be able to proclaim. They may be shut up, they may be chased out, but they knew that they would have the opportunity to proclaim the gospel to an assembly of Jews. Christians uh, met for worship on the appointed day by Jesus Christ to celebrate his glorious resurrection the first day of the week. We see in Acts chapter 20, verses 6 through 7, that this was the, the, the practice of Christians. Uh, they gathered on the first day of the week to hear preaching of God's word and to break bread, that is, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper as well. Uh, it says in Acts 20, verses 6 through 7, which we'll get to eventually in our series, and we sail the way. Uh, this is Luke, when it's in the first person like this, uh, Luke is including himself in uh, the events that are transpiring here. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. So Paul arrives in Troas. He's there for seven days, and yet we hear nothing about a service, a worship service the day before on the Jewish Sabbath. But we do hear that the Christians gather on the first day of the week, not the seventh day of the week, to hear the preaching of God's word and to uh, receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And Paul intended to leave on the morrow, on, on, on the second day of the week, or Monday, our Monday. And uh, so here, here we see established that this was the, the practice. This was the practice of, of uh, Christians to gather on the first day of the week. Likewise, in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 2, uh, we read, Paul speaking, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Now, if they met on, on the Jewish Sabbath, why would Paul not have said, when you gather on the seventh day of the week or when you gather on the jewish sabbath bring your your um, contributions uh bring together that which you've laid in store for to help others bring it on the seventh day you see this wasn't even limited uh to 
uh, uh, to the Corinthian church because Paul says that this is the same thing he told the churches of Galatia to do as well on the first day of the week, to bring together their diaconal offerings in order to minister to, to those in need. So this was, again, once, uh, once again, this was the, the practice. This was following uh, the day appointed by the Lord Jesus, uh, the day of his resurrection, the first day of the week. And in fact, in Revelation 1.10, uh, the Apostle John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So the Lord's Day uh, uh, becomes the, uh, the, the term used with regard to the first day of the week. Why? Because it was the day the Lord had appointed, instituted. It was the day of the Lord's resurrection. It was called the Lord's Day, the Lord Jesus, uh, the day of the Lord Jesus. Just as the Lord's Supper, and here you find the same uh, Greek adjective, uh, it's only used twice in the New Testament, the Lord's Day, uh, here, Lord, and then Lord, Lord's Supper. It's only used those two times. And in both cases, it refers to something Jesus instituted. It refers to the institution of Lord's Supper, uh, the Lord's Supper, the institution of the, uh, the Lord's Day, uh, the first day of the week. See, dear ones, uh, the approved example, the approved example of the apostles is equivalent to a direct precept from the Lord. Uh, if we find an approved example of the apostles uh, in the New Testament, that is equivalent in authority to a precept from the Lord. And that's what we have here. And many people are saying, but where is the command? Where is the precept? Well, the, 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 the precept and the command is found in the approved example uh, established by the apostles of Jesus Christ who, were, who, in doing so, were doing so infallibly. We're doing so according to the institution of Christ. Now, as Paul goes into uh, the Jewish synagogue on the Jewish Sabbath, uh, you, you will recall, and I'm sure he did uh, as well, uh, that there's already been a string of violent reactions from the Jews in Paul's previous missionary journey with Barnabas in the cities of Galatia. They were chased out of Antioch of Pisidia in Acts 13.50. They fled from Iconium due to an assault of the Jews and an, an attempt to stone him in Acts 14.5. Then in Lystra, Paul was actually stoned and left for dead in Acts 14.19. And yet, and yet Paul and Silas were able to look at this potentially dangerous situation from heaven's perspective and to see that they were as safe in the synagogue of Jews as they were in the home of Lydia. You see, dear ones, they were courageous. Courage, dear ones, is not the absence of all fear. Rather, courage is seeing the giants. It's seeing those tall trees, but it's beholding by faith. In spite of those trees that we see, those enemies that face us, it's seeing that Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ, is seated upon his throne in heaven and rules over all. Dear ones, if, if, uh, if one has courage, uh, again, it's not because he has no inkling of fear as to the danger of a situation. Otherwise, why would we call it courageous? What would there be to be courageous about if, if you don't even see or sense any fear? If you walk from one end of the room to the next, are you courageous? No, 
because what do you fear, you know, is going to happen? Fear, uh, courage is only manifested in the face of, of fear. And yet that fear is overwhelmed and overcome. It is subdued by faith and trust that God reigns. God is supreme. Jesus Christ rules. Courage is fearing God more than we fear man, more than we fear Satan, more than we fear any circumstance, whether loss of health, loss of relationships, loss of job, loss of wealth, or loss of life, fearing God more than any of those losses. And by fearing God, reverencing God, trusting him, knowing that he is ever faithful and ever true, that he cannot lie, he can only keep his promises unto us, his people. Courage, dear ones, is not seeing yourselves as victims, but as victors through Jesus Christ. It is not you who are surrounded by your enemies ultimately. It is our enemies who are surrounded by God, who are surrounded by the hosts of heaven, as was the case of Elisha's servant. However, courage, dear ones, without the truth is simply a counterfeit courage. For true biblical courage always stands for and defends the truth of Christ revealed in Scripture. An Islamic suicide bomber is not courageous, but is a wicked terrorist because he dies for a lie. That which gave Paul courage was that he was convinced of the truth of the gospel which he proclaimed to the Jews in that synagogue. Namely, the gospel that Jesus Christ suffered and died and was raised from the dead just as the Old Testament scriptures reveal he would. Because he knew that Jesus Christ was reigning in heaven his fears were subdued. Whatever anxiety he may have had, it was brought under control of the Holy Spirit by what Paul believed. And that's how, again, we as Christians will always demonstrate courage. It's because we believe something greater. We believe in the Lord God. We believe in the resurrected Christ and his truth more than we are willing to fear man or circumstances that we face. <clears throat> you see, dear ones, it's not one's physical strength that makes one courageous. It's not one's ability to defend oneself uh, by way of mere brawn or muscles or martial arts that makes one courageous. But Jesus and the truth which one believes is what makes one courageous. Remember how the apostles of Jesus Christ fled in fear before their enemies when Jesus was arrested and the Garden of Gethsemane. But after they beheld the resurrected Jesus, they were fearless in standing for and dying for the resurrected Jesus Christ and his truth. You see, their faith had laid hold of the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ and ascended Jesus Christ. And that truth and their confidence in that truth overwhelmed their fears. We read that Paul reasoned 
with the Jews out of the scriptures in Acts 17 too. That is, he, he disputed and he debated with the Jews from the scriptures of the Old Testament because that was what they had available. They did not have the canon of the New Testament at that time as Paul goes forth throughout the world. What they had was the canon of the Old Testament. Paul was likewise opening we read here, he was opening their understanding to the Old Testament scriptures as really all effective preaching does. Effective preaching opens the mind and understanding so that when people read the scripture, they have an understanding of what God is saying to them through the scriptures. That's one of the purposes for preaching, and that's effective preaching. It doesn't happen just by virtue of, of the preacher preaching and the listener hearing. It happens because the Holy Spirit applies the word, opens the heart, just as it says the Holy Spirit did with Lydia, opened her heart and she believed. And so likewise, whenever you understand anything in the word of God, it's because the Holy Spirit opened your mind and your heart to receive it and to understand it. Paul was opening their understanding and alleging, it says, that is placing before them from the Old Testament scriptures, the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. From the Old Testament scriptures. Not from the New Testament scriptures, but from the Old Testament scriptures. He was teaching them that the Messiah, the Christ, that is prophesied, it is prophesied that he must needs suffer, die, be buried, and rise again. And all of that came from the Old Testament scriptures. If you were, <clears throat> if you were testifying, if you're witnessing to uh, a Jewish person, where would you go in the Old Testament to demonstrate that Jesus Christ, who came in, in the New Testament and is revealed in the New Testament, that he was prophesied to come in the Old Testament? Where would you go to demonstrate that he was to die and he was to be buried and he was to be raised again from the dead? Where would you go? Well, we don't know where Paul went. He doesn't say uh, where he went. But probably three very good places that we should take uh, a Jew who, to whom we are presenting the gospel would be uh, Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. And I'm just going to turn there very briefly. Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 4. Again, prophecy of the Messiah who was to come. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. The we here is Israel. We esteemed him not. We consider him uh, despised. Verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Very important what is said there. The Jews, according to Isaiah, Israel, when the Messiah comes, would not receive him. They would rather consider him cursed of God, smitten by God, which is exactly why he died upon a cross, because 
he bore our curse. The curse that, that lay heavily upon us, he became a curse for us, which is, which is typified and, and indicated by way of his death upon a cross. Prophecy fulfilled, even in their rejection and even how they viewed him. And in verses, we could read the whole chapter, but in verses 8 through 9, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. That's what he said. That's what he said. He came to lay down his life for his sheep. Verse 9, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. He, he had a tomb in which he was buried. Not a tomb of his own. He, was, he had nothing by way of material possessions, but he had a tomb that was prepared and given to him by one who was wealthy. Once again, uh, prophesied in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Absolutely true of Christ. You might also want to go to Psalm 16, 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. As Peter says in Acts 2, this can't be David speaking because David, David did die. David, David's body was corrupted. It what, did lie in a grave. It did deteriorate. Who is this speaking of? It's speaking of the greater David, the son of David, the Messiah, Christ, that he would not see corruption in his body, but he would be raised from the dead. And then in Psalm 22, one last place in the Old Testament might go to bear testimony of Jesus Christ to an unbelieving Jew. Psalm 22, verses 16 through 18, they pierced my hands and my feet. This is speaking of crucifixion. That wasn't known at that time. Crucifixion at that period in which David writes here was not a form of execution that was practiced by nations of the world at that time. It became that of the Romans. They applied uh, crucifixion uh, uh, to those they considered worthy of it. So this is speaking again of crucifixion. Um, Pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. A public execution. All people are looking upon and staring at him. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. This is the Messiah. They did exactly that. The soldiers at, at the base of the cross depart, uh, uh, divided his garment amongst themselves. And so Paul went to the Old Testament scriptures. He went to the prophecies and showed that Jesus alone was the one who fulfilled those prophecies. For you see, there is what the Old Testament promises, the New Testament realizes. And that's what we see. Again, the unity of the Old Testament and the New Testament. We can't understand the New Testament as we ought without understanding the Old Testament. They are one book. They are one book. The gospel is proclaimed in the Old Testament. The gospel is proclaimed in the New Testament. The gospel and the full realization of salvation is promised in the Old Testament and realized in the New Testament, in the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to, just a, a side note here before moving on, 
I want to make it clear that it's not sent for or wrong. Paul was debating with the Jews. There was uh, the word that's used there uh, indicates that there was back and forth that was going on between Paul and the Jews in the synagogue. It's not wrong to debate a matter of doctrine or practice from the scriptures. In fact, uh, in fact, we should stand for the truth. We should be uh, able to answer questions that are asked of us. We, we should seek to understand and know our faith that we would be able, if we don't know the answer, to, to go out and search out the answer and to come to somebody with the answer that we find in Scripture. But many professing Christians will not discuss, they will not debate the truths of Scripture because they think or act as if they are, they are taking a higher moral ground and not wanting to be divisive. Uh, the, the mantra is, doctrine divides. Therefore, we can't, we can't uh, debate. We cannot discuss uh, uh, doctrine. Uh, we cannot defend the truth of Jesus Christ because doctrine, doctrine is simply the teaching. That's all it means. Doctrine means teaching. It's the teaching of Christ and the apostles, the teaching of the of prophets in the Old Testament. It's the teaching of God's word. That's all the doctrine is. And if we cannot stand for and if we cannot defend a doctrine, then we will be overrun by heresy. Of course, doctrine divides because there's heresy and error that runs rampant. And therefore, because we will not bend the knee to the error and the heresy, doctrine is going to se separate. The truth is going to separate. It's going to, to divide the wheat from the chaff. Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 18 through 19, for first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. What, what's causing these divisions? What's leading to these, these divisions uh, amongst those who are within the church in Corinth? Paul says, and I partly believe it, for there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. In other words, when heresy comes, when error comes into the church, the Lord appoints that to happen and doesn't prevent it from happening because he is indicating who is approved, who will stand for the truth, who will stand for the, the sound doctrine that comes from God's word, as opposed to those who will succumb to the error, to the heresy. It's not the truth that ultimately is responsible for the division, though it does, practically speaking, bring about division. It's the error. It's the sin that divides and corrupts. The doctrine concerning the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ here once divided Paul from the Jews here in Acts 17. Uh, the gospel, the gospel, dear ones, was not about Paul. The gospel was about Jesus Christ. Paul did not exalt himself. He exalted the truth. It was the gospel, dear ones, that was the offense to the unbelieving Jews. It was not Paul that was the offense. It was the gospel. It was not his personality that was the offense. It was not some alleged obnoxiousness that is ever raised by those who disbelieve the gospel that Paul preaches. No, it's not any of those things. It's the truth. It's the truth that offends. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that offends. And therefore, likewise with us, dear ones, when we present the truth, let it not be our personality. Let it not be our obnoxiousness. Let it not be... Uh, our rashness and our anger and our bitterness that divides. But let it be, again, the truth of Jesus Christ. If there is going to be offense, let them take offense, not at us. Let them take offense 
at the gospel of Jesus Christ and the truth of Jesus Christ. Paul says in Ephesians 4.15 that this is our standard, this is our model, to speak the truth in love. You see, dear ones, Paul never tired of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He never tired of preaching it because he never forget, forgot what he deserved from God, namely condemnation, and yet what God freely gave him, salvation. That's why Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through 16, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. You see, how could Paul possibly tire of hearing that his sin and his condemnation that he deserved has been forgiven, removed and taken away by Jesus Christ? That though he deserved hell, Jesus Christ has granted to him heaven forevermore. How could he, how could you or I ever tire of hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ that rescues and saves us. How could we possibly say, or uh, perhaps we'd never say it audibly, but maybe in our minds when the preacher is preaching and we come again to uh, that portion of the sermon where the gospel of Jesus Christ is presented. Yeah, I've heard it a million times. Let's move on to something more interesting, something that I don't already know. Something I've not already learned. No, that's not the way any of us should ever react to hearing the gospel of our salvation. It should humble us. It should bring us to tears. It should bring us to the place where we are praising and lifting our hearts to Jesus Christ because he had mercy upon us when there was no one else who would. Only God, only God had mercy upon us, and only God could have mercy that rescues and saves now and for all eternity. Dear ones, it's only the gospel of Jesus Christ that will daily, every day, refresh you and enable you to live a godly life by reflecting upon uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ by meditating upon the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he suffered upon the cross that he was raised from the dead that there now is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus every day bathing your conscience in the gospel of Jesus Christ there is nothing more healthy to your soul then daily reminding yourself going over in your mind the gospel of Christ and praising and thanking him without being refreshed Jones, with the death and the res resurrection of Jesus Christ I submit that you'll either stray into legalism trying to save yourself by your own obedience or you'll stray into lawlessness thinking that you do not need uh, uh, anything from the Lord now you're saved and you can just live however you please you now the gospel the gospel sends us to Jesus Christ and causes us to see what he was willing to suffer and die to remove our sin how can we therefore live any longer in that sin. Well, some of the Jews believed, along with a great multitude of the of the Gentile God fears or or proselytes there in Thessalonica, and the Holy Spirit 
considers it worthy of note, both here in Thessalonica as well as in Berea, that there were chief uh, women in Thessalonica who also believed, likely the wives of, of leaders uh, within Thessalonica, who trusted alone in Jesus Christ alone for their eternal salvation in verse 4 of Acts 17. But trouble, dear ones, never seems too far behind effective preaching of the truth of Jesus Christ. The unbelieving Jews were stirred up with envy in despising the effective preaching of Paul, and they seek to destroy the truth by destroying Paul. They seek to smother the truth by smothering Paul. And so they gather uh, what are called here lewd fellows. Really, they are hired agitators. And again, there are certain things that are never new. Uh, there's uh, this still happens, uh, whether it's in South Africa where hired agitators break through fences in the, in the farm of our brother and sister, uh, the Plaths in South Africa, or whether it be that on the streets uh, of our cities where hired agitators are breaking down uh, walls and barriers and breaking windows, hired agitators simply to bring about uh, uh, confusion and fear and terror in the hearts of people that we must therefore follow what is being said or all of our that we hold and believe in will be destroyed if we don't follow down the path that these people want. And so they form a mob and setting the city of Thessalonica aflame in an uproar in Acts 17.5. They can't find Paul and Silas. Uh, the brethren have carefully hid Paul and Silas. And so they go to the home where Paul and Silas were staying, that of Jason, a new convert uh, uh, to the faith of Jesus Christ. And there they bring Jason before the magistrates, falsely accusing Paul and Silas through Jason of overturning the peace of the Roman world when they say in verse 6, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Actually, they were turning the world right side up, not upside down. Once again, it was not Paul and Silas here that were the troublemakers, but the unbelieving Jews. It was unbelievers that were the troublemakers. The truth was presented the truth was despised. The gospel was hated. And because they sought to quiet, to silence uh, the gospel, they had to, to try to silence Paul and Silas. There are two charges brought by the mob here against Paul and Silas uh, before the magistrates. Uh, first of all, they are lawless. Uh, they are lawless. Uh, when we read in verse 7, whom Jason hath received, and these do all contrary to the de decrees of Caesar. They're lawless. They do what's contrary to the decrees of, of Caesar. Why were they lawless? Because, I submit to you, because they were teaching an exclusive Christ. They were not teaching that Christ is one among many. They were not teaching that Christ is amongst the pantheon of, of the Roman gods or the Greek gods. They were teaching that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, that Jesus Christ is, and that the God of the Bible, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the God of the Bible is the only true God, the only God that we must worship Second of all, they were, tre uh, they were charged with treason. They were treasonous. Why? Again, in verse 7, uh, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. You see, they preached and taught that Jesus Christ was Lord and king over all, even over Caesar. You see, this did not go well with Romans, uh, particularly who believed in, in uh, 
very in the case of various emperors that they were actually gods themselves there came a point in which christians were were forced later on after the time of paul but they were forced later on uh, to uh, uh, either offer incense to an image of caesar or be put to death be thrown into the Colosseum to be eaten by wild animals, to, to be decapitated, uh, to be tortured one way or another, to offer the incense and to say, Caesar is Lord. Christians stood firmly and said, no, Jesus is Lord. Jesus alone is Lord. And for that, they were called traitors because they would not acknowledge Caesar to be Lord. And that's what the charge is here. Paul was not teaching that Caesar was Lord, but rather that Jesus is Lord. And this is always the case. Even since that time, there's always that uh, happening uh, in, in our lives. It's either Jesus or Caesar. It's either Jesus or our family. It's either Jesus or our friends. It's either Jesus or our boss. It's either Jesus or our lusts and our pleasures or power. Dear ones, we know who is Lord of our life by whom we serve. Do we serve, do we serve as Lord of our life, people, relationships, our jobs? Do we serve money? Do we serve power, prestige, the approval of men, sex? What do we serve? What is the Lord of our life? You see, it's not something limited to the ages gone by, Caesar or Christ. No, it continues. That same question continues to be raised in our lives. Who is Lord of your life? Jesus doesn't tolerate other lords of the Christian's life. It is Jesus who is Lord over all. Well, the rulers of Thessalonica were so concerned to maintain some semblance of uh, peace and order that they took from Jason uh, a written bond or security of some kind, uh, indicating that Paul and Silas would not return again. To Thessalonica in Acts 17 9 which may be that to which Paul refers in 1st Thessalonians 2 18 Paul says speaking to the Thessalonians he this is the letter he wrote to them after he left Thessalonica he shortly thereafter not too long afterwards sent this letter back to them and this he says to them Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. And it may have been, in fact, this, this bond that until these magistrates, these rulers died, uh, or uh, something of that nature, that, that they were not allowed to come back uh, into uh, the city of Thessalonica. Uh, that didn't prevent... Paul writing in a second letter to encourage them, and we see their, their amazing growth. It was a, a wondrous uh, uh, church, an amazing church that was founded there in Thessalonica. As you read through uh, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. The trouble followed the effective preaching of the Apostle Paul, and though the enemies of Paul and Silas surrounded them. The kingdom of God was not destroyed. The kingdom of God continued to advance. It continued to move forward regardless, regardless of what they faced by way of accusations and hatred and, and persecution. There is, we can clearly see how God prospered the kingdom of Christ here in the midst of an infant church but we find it so hard to see how the lord is advancing the kingdom of christ when we face 
similar kinds of trials. It's easy for us to look back and to see how the Lord was prospering and blessing and advancing in the midst of persecution. And we can rejoice from a distance in, in, in that advance of the kingdom of Christ. But there was, Jesus is no less advancing his kingdom in your life, in your family, and in the circumstances of life in this nation, in the, the very feeble church of Jesus Christ as it stumbles along, he is advancing his kingdom. And we must always keep that in mind. Jesus is not in retreat. He is the conqueror. He is the victor. He is the overcomer and has already legally overcome all his and your enemies. And he was, a, again, we see in the killing times in Scotland from 1680 to 1688. We see during that time of great persecution that the faithful would gather by the hundreds and the thousands in fields far distant from the cities, in alongside brooks, in meadows, mountainsides there. They would gather to hear the preachers, the covenanter preachers come and to declare to them the glories of Jesus Christ, to feed them the word of God. And they were willing, in spite of all of the persecution that they faced, even having bounty upon their head, if they should be caught, and if they should be caught, they could lose their, their, their estates, everything they own in this world. They could be tortured. They could be put to death. And attending, and yet they attended by the hundreds and the thousands to hear the word of God preached. Effective preaching. God blesses effective preaching. In the midst of persecution, God blesses effective preaching. Glory be to his name. Effective preaching, dear ones, always, always overcomes persecution. But we come to the second main point. Blessing follows the Bereans' effective listening in our uh, final point here. Look with me, Acts 17, verses 10 through 15. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. They were more noble, or these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Well, we've seen how trouble and persecution often, often follow effective preaching, but it cannot destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ. It cannot prevent the advance of the kingdom of Christ. For Jesus the King causes even trouble from enemies to build us, to sanctify us, and to strengthen us. And now we turn from the effective preaching of Paul to the Thessalonians, to the effective hearing of the preaching by the Bereans. Dear ones, there is not only a need for effective preaching of the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ from scripture, but also there is a need for effective hearing if the gospel is to prosper and grow in advancing the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Paul and Silas, <clears throat> as we saw, were hidden from the mob in Thessalonica by the new converts and were secretly sent away 
by night to the town of Berea, approximately 50 miles southwest of Thessalonica. They go right back, again, courage. They go right back into the Jewish synagogue to proclaim the gospel in Acts 17.10. But in this case, there's something noted. The Jews in Berea, it says, were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Literally well-born. Noble means uh, literally well-born, but not in a physical sense, uh, not in a genetic sense uh, that they were uh, uh, phys uh, that of physical nobility, but we're talking here about the character of nobility because of their willingness to receive and search out the scriptures, which was, again, the work of God, God's beginning work in their lives. But nevertheless, they were willing to do this. The Bereans demonstrate and give to us, dear ones, an example as to how to be ourselves, effective hearers and listeners of God's word that is preached to us in Acts 17, 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Effective preaching plus effective hearing will advance, dear ones, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, even in facing great opposition and adversity. First of all, how did they hear? It says, and first of all, they received the word with all readiness of mind in Acts 17, 11. These Bereans were anticipating with eagerness and ready to receive the truth proclaimed by Paul and Silas. They were not mere spectators sitting on the sidelines or in the grandstands, but were active in preparing their hearts, not only to hear with their natural ears, but also to receive with their hearts the truth that would be proclaimed to them. Dear ones, we, we should not really expect the word of God to speak to us by the Holy Spirit if we had taken no time to prepare our hearts to receive it eagerly earnestly, sincerely, with all readiness of mind. Preaching, dear ones, has nothing to do, faithful preaching, effective preaching, really has nothing to do with who the preacher is. It has everything to do with whose word it is. It's God's word. It's not the preacher's word. We oftentimes get so hung up with the style of the preacher. We get so hung up over issues of whether he is an extraordinary preacher or just an ordinary preacher, whether he's a dynamic preacher, whether he's an articulate preacher, or if he's just a common preacher. Dear ones, I care not about any of those types of distinctions. What I care about is faithfulness to God's holy word, a willingness to proclaim it without compromise and to stand for it and defend it, not only with the preacher's voice, but by way of his actions as well. And dear ones, if your heart is to be prepared to hear the word of God preached, it means you're going to be spending time throughout the week making your heart, preparing your heart in prayer, calling upon the Lord to, to plow up that stony ground, that hard ground in your heart, that the word of God might be planted as good seed into your heart and that it might be watered by the Holy Spirit and bring forth fruit in your lives to change and transform you. If you can, dear ones, get all excited about a football game, get all excited about a concert, or get all excited about a family gathering, but have little or no excitement, and are 
easily distracted and fall asleep while the word of God is being preached. You are not well spiritually. That's an indication. Something is desperately wrong with you. And you should take that seriously as a wake up call. If that's true of you. Even when the minister, dear ones, does not present, in your opinion, an unforgettable sermon, if you receive the word with all readiness of mind, you will not walk away empty. You'll walk away filled. You'll walk away encouraged that God, not the minister, God has spoken to you through his word and by his spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit and giving to us a willing reception with all readiness of mind. Secondly, the Bereans search the scriptures daily, whether the truths proclaimed by Paul and Silas were found in the scriptures. In Acts 17, verse 11. You see, the Bereans did not likely have their own copies of the, of the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, those were very rare. Uh, those were very scarce. Uh, likely, their synagogue did have a copy. So they probably, in order to go to the scriptures, they had to take what Paul and Silas proclaimed, go to their synagogue, open the Old Testament copy of scriptures that they had, and search out whether or not what Paul and Silas were saying by way of the prophecies from the Old Testament concerning the Messiah, whether those were found in the scriptures as Paul and Silas said they were. There had to be uh, some effort put forth on their part to be that interested, to want to search out uh, how blessed we are, dear ones, that we have copies of, of, of the scripture in our own language in our homes, multiple copies, multiple. And this, dear ones, many of our Reformed forefathers have suffered and died that we might have copies of the scripture. They were willing to be burned at the stake, hung, beheaded, that we might have the truth of Jesus Christ. The teaching of Paul and Silas was, was only as good as it was agreeable to the scriptures. The Bereans, dear ones, are not here criticized for comparing the words of the apostles to the word of God, but rather they are commended for doing so. Your love for Jesus Christ should be manifested Jones, by your desire to compare what is preached from this pulpit to the whole counsel of God that you find in Holy Scripture. Scripture, dear ones, alone, alone is the infallible standard for doctrine and for practice. Our creeds, our confessions, our catechisms, and our covenants are only authoritative as they are agreeable to the infallible standard of God's holy word, which we believe them to be agreeable to the standard of God's holy word. Searching the scripture means that you take, dear ones, notes, either writing them down or mental notes, you take notes. And you discuss with your family. You think, you reflect upon the sermon after it's preached. You pull aside, you try to have some time to reflect upon what was preached this Lord's Day. You discuss it. You, you, you ask your, your family, are there any questions? Do you, did you understand what was said uh, with regard to the preaching of God's word. So there should be, again, that type of going over and, and comparing uh, what the minister says to what God's word says. And then thirdly, we see they believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bereans says, therefore, in verse 12, therefore, the therefore 
comes because of what preceded. Because they uh, had received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, because of that, many of them believed. Many of them believed. You see, when the means were blessed by the Spirit of God, that is, receiving with all readiness of mind and searching the scriptures, the end was realized by the Spirit of God. They believed the gospel of Jesus Christ that was preached to them. In fact, many of the Jews, it says in this particular instance, many of the Jews in Berea believed together with the Greeks who attended the synagogue uh, meetings and along with, again, honorable women in the city. This was the result of effective listening. Faith in Jesus, Jesus Christ grows and abounds and affects others around us when we effectively listen. We're taking it in because, dear ones, as we take it in, we're showing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and faith is contagious. Faith in Jesus Christ is contagious. The kingdom of God, dear ones, advances by this means. Not only by means of effective preaching, but by means of effective listening. And once again, the enemy is just around the corner, waiting to sabotage the work of God. In Acts 17, verses 13 through 15, the Jews from Thessalonica appear in Berea, 50 miles away, to stir up trouble in Berea against the truth of Christ and against the apostles. But the enemy does this in order always. The, 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 the enemy knows he cannot destroy the truth of Jesus Christ. He knows he cannot destroy Jesus Christ who reigns over him. And so he seeks to discourage us by the trials, by the tribulation, by the persecution that come our way. The enemy seeks to discourage and to tempt us to believe the lie that Satan is in control and all is lost. We might as well just give up when those times like huge trees, tall trees surround us. We feel swallowed up by them. We might as well just give up. The enemy does not, as we said, do so to discourage Jesus, but to discourage us. Jesus Christ, King Jesus Christ, is fulfilling, however, his plan in building the faith of his people through what we suffer for him. We may only be able, dear ones, to see the enemies that threaten and and intimidate us, but that is when we must, by faith, even when that's all we see, that's when we must shake ourselves. That's when we must be uh, brought to see that we will be destroyed. We will be overwhelmed if that's where we keep our eye, is upon the enemy, upon the circumstance, upon that person. That's when we will be swallowed up. We must, by faith, soar above, soar above the enemy to view the battle from heaven's perspective, from Christ's perspective, who's not shaken, who's not moved by anything that we go through, but lives in everlasting peace because he is bringing all things to his own wise, loving, appointed ends for his people. The kingdom of Jesus Christ, dear ones, is invincible, just as Jesus our king is invincible. The kingdoms of this world, dear ones, will, not might, the kingdoms of this world will one day become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, according to Revelation eleven fifteen. That's as certain as is, that's as certain to happen as anything else that you believe uh, is, is, is certain. Uh, the, the deity of Jesus Christ. The fact that God will bring the nations unto himself is as certain as the fact that Jesus is God. I wonder, dear ones, as I close, have you become discouraged because you not see the growth of Christ's kingdom in your life, in your home, in the church, in this nation? Jesus said it's like the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. 
the smallest of seas at that particular time known uh, at that time in history in which Jesus spoke this. That is growing. That mustard seed is growing and shall continue to grow until it fills the whole world and, and birds are able to occupy the branches of that mustard tree. You see, this is heaven's perspective. That's heaven's perspective of the kingdom of Christ. That's not the world's perspective. That's the perspective that we must continue to embrace Christ's kingdom, regardless of what is going on in this world, your life, your family. Christ's kingdom is advancing. It is moving forward. If you are discouraged today, if you are depressed, if you are overwhelmed, by the enemies that seem to surround and engulf you as a child of God. It is because, dear ones, you are only seeing with your natural eyes and listening with your, your ears. You're listening to the suggestions of Satan that all is lost. Nothing will change. You might as well surrender. This is the battle that is constantly waged in your mind and in mine. That is the battle for supremacy of your mind and of your heart. Who will you believe? Satan, the liar, or will you rather believe Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life? You see, Moses had the same decision to make. He had the same decision. By faith, would he choose by faith to suffer affliction with God's people rather than enjoy pleasures of Egypt, the power of Egypt for a season? Hebrews 11 says, he esteemed suffering for Christ greater riches than all the treasures in Egypt. For he was looking beyond. He wasn't merely looking at the circumstances. He was looking beyond what he could see with his natural eyes and by faith saw that Christ was seated on his throne and that the kingdom of God would prevail over the greatest empire at that time, Egypt. Dear ones, dear ones, Call the enemy a liar and stand by faith with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the king who is advancing his kingdom and his kingdom will fill all the earth. Amen. Please stand with me in prayer. A great and mighty savior. Glory be to thee, exalted art thou, our God, above all thine enemies. The Lord Jesus has already legally crushed and defeated them, and he will do so in history. Lord, may we not grow weary in well-doing. May we not fear what man can do unto us. May we not fear the circumstances that come our way. For, O oh Lord, thou art advancing thy kingdom even through such situations may our eye of faith be upon christ seated at thy right hand who is king and lord over all we praise thee our lord for lifting our hearts and our our faith above the huge trees that seem to engulf us that we can't see anywhere else they seem to preoccupy and take so much of our time but father we are tired we are tired of being overcome by these things and we cast Lord ourselves upon thee and ask Lord to lift us up by faith to soar above the enemy that we might be able to see that Christ reigns supreme and he is working out his plan advancing his kingdom through it all we ask Lord hear our prayers in Jesus name amen, amen.
Please take your Psalters and turn with me to Psalm 104. And we'll be singing verses 16 through 23. This continues the same theme that, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the psalmist is simply drawing our attention to the fact that God, in a very personal way, uh, notice the personal pro pronouns uh, that God uh, uh, accomplishes by way of, of providing for his creation. Uh, he uh, it speaks of him uh, supplying the, the uh, needs of the lions. Uh, he sets the moon uh, in heaven. Uh, he orders um, uh, all that that uh, that is needed uh, by way of his creation every moment of the day. If he were to withdraw his sustaining hand, it would immediately uh, uh, vanish. It would in immediately be destroyed. Uh, but he upholds it and he will uphold us. He will uphold uh, his new creation. If he upholds his first creation, he will uphold his new creation. Those who are in Christ Jesus. We'll be uh, uh, lining the, I'll be lining the psalm out again, and we'll be uh, uh, using the tune Thanksgiving. The trees of God are full of sap. The trees of God are full of sap. The cedars that do stand. The cedars that do stand. In Lebanon, which planted were. In Lebanon, which planted were. By his almighty hand. By his almighty hand. Birds of the air upon their boughs. Birds of the air upon their boughs. To choose their nest to make. To choose their nest to make. As for the stork, the fir tree, she. As for the stork, the fir tree, she. Doth for her dwelling take. Doth for her dwelling take. The lofty mountains for wild goats. The lofty mountain and for wild goats, a place of refuge be, a place of refuge be. The conies also to the rocks, the conies also to the rocks. Do for their safety flee. Do for their safety flee. He sets the moon in heaven thereby. He sets the moon in heaven thereby. The seasons to discern. The seasons to discern. From him the sun his certain time. From him the sun his certain time. Of going down doth learn. Of going down doth learn. Thou darkness makes tis night, then beasts. Thou darkness makes tis night, then beasts. A forest creep abroad. A forest creep abroad. The lion's young roar for their prey. 
today from Ephesians 3 verses 20 to 21 now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end amen you are dismissed